Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil, joined by John today. Today is episode number 112. I want to thank Shaper Tools for sponsoring today's podcast. They're the makers of the Shaper Origin, the handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. Tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. Right now, you can try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. We're here. It's kind of a, it's a crazy week here. Yep. Yep. We did all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. Had a magazine go out the door. Logan was out in Las Vegas and back without any jail time. <laughs> Always a success. Yeah. He can't did go back to TV jail. show stuff. He, he can't. He no. cannot go back to jail. <laughs> yeah. So, but so one of the things that I wanted to talk about today, and it ended up being somewhat prophetic based on what happened earlier this morning, is about rescuing, reusing, and repairing furniture. Hmm. And we'll start off by the repairing part because. We're in the middle of shooting a TV show episode and it's a, it just, it's a stick chair that Dylan designed and we featured in the magazine, I don't know, a year or two ago. I think it was pretty cool. They're comfortable and we're building a version out of cherry for the TV show. And I went to attach the arm bow, hand rest, whatever you want to call it, to the upper spindles. And something went wrong in our earlier construction process. So that the front spindles and the back spindles didn't really match together Mm -hmm. with the holes in the arm bow. And we ended up breaking one spindle at the tenon and turning the arm bow into like four or five different pieces. Right. Yeah. Usually you don't want to do furniture repair and rescue while you're building the furniture, <laughs> but it does happen. Um, yes. More times than we care to admit, or, I mean, usually yeah. something is not exploding, but you know, there's stuff here and there that you're trying to work around. Right. That you're, yeah. Problem solving as you go along, but to have it, you know, like to have that, spindle just snap right at the base and then the arm bow to shatter. That was kind of, kind of spectacular. Yes. But, but what I wanted to, so there's that. And then I just had to walk away a little bit. It was, it was frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times that'll happen. And if you try to keep going without taking a little pause, things get worse. And it's just more frustrating and <laughs> more breaking and more hammering and so, yeah. but it's, yeah, you definitely auger in after, after a little bit. So yeah, I could see it happening and I just, so I walked away, came back, took a couple of deep breaths and then we just, rather than trying to continue on, took some stuff apart that, that could come apart. Mm-hmm. And then we'll just have to remake a few pieces. Yeah. Not too bad. No, it's not as bad as it seems. It never is. So, Yeah, that's the... the other thing is realizing that. But I know that uh, as woodworkers, we get roped into fixing or rescuing pieces for other, for friends and family. Mm-hmm. And I think as woodworkers, it's also really easy to see pieces of furniture that have lived a full life and want to help them along on another life. So I was wondering if you've ever run into that and do you have any thoughts on how you go about or examples of what you've done? I'm sure I have run into it. Um, Usually I try my best to avoid it. Especially when it's, uh, (laughs) when the, I mean, you've experienced this a little this week is, um, 
trying to like fix a finish or match a finish or make it look like you didn't try to fix a finish because it's always like color like if it's stained or you know whatever it's it's hard to to match that because of just of the age you know uh wood changes right. color over time on a lot of you know cherry and and whatnot so if you know you start sanding in a spot it, and you uncover some lighter wood you can't it's hard to just come back with some stain and and match that color so that's always yeah. you know a big challenge there um <clears throat> Usually if you can, you know, fix something without affecting the finish, it's a lot easier, whether it's like just, you know, gluing back or uh, like a chair back together or a joint where you can kind of um, syringe glue in there and avoid a big mess. It's a little bit easier. But once you start messing with the finish, it's it's a whole nother ball game. And a lot of times I wish I would have just started from scratch rather than, than fixing it because it's... You know, you start changing one thing and then it turns into something else and it can be frustrating. Yeah, Yeah, because there's a in the process of us moving around here that we've talked about past few weeks, uh, we've been getting rid of some of the projects that we have around here through company auctions and sales and stuff like that. And I ended up with one of it was a project that you built or you designed and built, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, And the top because of how it lives in an office had some scratches in the finish. And I thought, well, I can just, I can fairly easily sand out the scratches cause they were pretty light and in the finish itself. And, and I had done that and put on a couple of coats of finish and we used it as a prop for a video and in the process there ended up with like a ridge in the finish. And I wanted to just level it before putting on a top final coat. So we had a, I was going to use a power sander with 400 grit disc. So it wasn't too aggressive, but got done what I needed to and got the sander landed in there. And then somewhere in there, it jerked on me and cut a divot right down through the finish to bare wood on mahogany. And it just was lit up like a, like a light on there, just how drastic that color was and i had gotten some sand through on another part and just by putting some oil finish on there felt like that went away but this one for whatever reason was stayed lighter so i'm trying to decide whether i just end up having to sand it all down to bare wood which i really don't want to do right or see if that light mark will fade or darken over time. Mm-hmm. So it's frustrating, but you're right. If it has to do with altering the color of finish or like you said, trying to match finish, that is a whole nother level. That's a different wizarding level than yeah. what yep. I, you have to a lot of, have a lot of finesse to, to get away with that. I feel so. Yeah. Cause I, I've repaired other pieces and it's, that part is kind of a fun challenge of having, you know, trying to either replace a part or re-glue joints or, you know, reinforce something. That part isn't too bad, but, Mm -hmm. and I actually enjoy that quite a bit, being able to take a piece that seems like it's just doomed to be burned or tossed into a landfill and right be able to bring it back yeah i'm all often also reminded of um behind you over the wall there is a sideboard that in a uh move a few years ago <laughs> logan and i were loading it onto a trailer and someone lost their grip and it went face first into the asphalt parking lot uh-huh. and, and the edge of the trailer yes and the edge of the trailer and for the most part, it survived, but it has a few dents and dings. I think it, uh, we might have broke a, a drawer front that we were able to fix, but there are some, you know, broken pieces of trim and whatnot. So we're often reminded of that because it hasn't been fully fixed. And it's like, what can we do with this? Because it's, it's a beautiful piece of furniture. Oh, yeah. It's cherry and, um, you know, it's 
uh, a little bit beyond of just, you know, uh, touch up pins and stain matching. Um, but it's not, I mean, it's structurally still a good piece of furniture. So I'm trying to figure out what, you know, I walk by about every day. So always thinking about what can we do to salvage this and make it look great again. And yeah, but, and that's the thing is cause it, I feel like there's different levels of involvement that you want to mm -hmm. go on it. Like for that table, I could just leave it as is. It's got a, I put a nice coat of finish on it that turned out pretty well. Just let it go mm -hmm. and own its mistake, waiting for time and whatever to even out the color. Or do I go next level and sand it all down to bare wood and start over? with it, but that mm -hmm. presents more problems. Cause it's like, what do I do about the edge of the tabletop? And then now the tabletop's not going to match the base of the table. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like you've said before, when you're at a Mexican restaurant and you got the chips and the salsa, where does it end? Yeah. How does it stop? Do you die or do they just run out or, you know, yeah. How, yeah. where does it go? Yeah. No one knows. Yeah. So. So that's the same thing. And I'll put photos of these items on our show notes page that goes with this episode. So I would love it if people would be able to see some of these things and then comment on them and let me know mm -hmm. where, like, where do you draw the line on it? That's, it's a legitimate question because that sideboard, it's really just a piece of bead molding. You know, there's mm -hmm. a couple of dings in it. Like, do we allow it? One solution would be to just pry off the bead molding and make new bead molding and put it in mm -hmm. there. And that that's not serious surgery, but it's still a surgical procedure. Yeah. Cause if you do that, it's like, how well is that glued on? And you know, is that going to pull something else apart? And yeah. So, or do we try and just get it close, you know, close up the joint as you know the break as much as we can and then putty stick and wax filler and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and call it good. And it's just a piece of furniture that had a bad day. Yep. Or do you get totally nutty and bring out the glue and Bondo and give it a distressed painted finish <laughs> and just, you know, cover the whole thing right. up and yeah, just go, go totally crazy on it. But well, cause you see that a lot on, I feel like I see that a lot on, like Instagram and YouTube where somebody said, you know, they find some piece of furniture, garage sale, side of the road, whatever. And it's a grandma looking piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. And then they take it and yeah, Bondo and paint it. And now it's, it looks a little bit more hip and of the moment in a, in a paint color, but you know, you're almost right. never going to be able to go back to right. a natural finish on that. Yeah. It's like once you paint it, there's no going back. It's just going to be painted forever. Yeah. Just maybe a different color. Right. I mean, which is, again, that's like the whole, that would be like a celebrity facelift operation kind of level of furniture rescue mm -hmm. and repair. I'm probably, if... If I had a philosophy, it would probably be more of a get it back to a functional state mm -hmm. and then freshen up whatever finishes on there yeah. rather than uh, a total rebuild or a strip down to bare wood and, and start mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And another thing is like the table you're talking about that has just a little bit of sand through that's, you know has a little bit different color if the light hits it right. And, you know, do you keep messing with it or do you know in use that it's like, there's probably going to be a lamp there or right. some sort of knickknack or a, yeah. you know, whatever is going to go on that table and you'll never see it. I mean, you see it now that it's in the light in the shop and nothing's on the table or, you know, can you, it's, you got to think is when something's in function, is it going to be that noticeable or yeah. just let it go or without too much more work and right. whatnot. So. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a formula there of what's your time involved? 
what time do you have available to do it? You know, how much effort do you want to go into it based on what it's going to be? You know, like that sideboard or that table or that stick chair, these are not museum pieces. They're meant to be used and lived with. And over time, you know, a dog's going to jump up on the chair and scratch it or some kid is going to bang matchbox cars on it or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So these are the problems we live with. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we also, it, especially when we have something in our workshop, we just see that item kind of like what you were saying with that table is when you look at the table and there's nothing on it, you see that, but short of staging a house for selling that table is never going to look like that. There's going to be right. something on it. So, and then like when I'm building a piece of furniture, I think I've shared this before is having the five foot five year principle that if you can't see it from five feet away, the problem doesn't exist. And in five years you won't remember it. Mm -hmm. Which we had to remind our newest editor, Rob Petrie about that. He did a video series on a set of nesting tables that we featured in the magazine almost before he was born. And it had dovetails in it. And it was really his, his first go at dovetails in a really, you know, like where they're on display. And these mm -hmm. nesting tables definitely have an on display look. So, so he had, he had some issues with it, but we showed him ways to fill gaps and wedge holes and things like that. So that it got to a point where the tables, I think look really good. I think it's a, yeah. they're a solid, solid set that he did. So, yeah. Yeah. I kind of find the same frustrations in projects that I build that you're almost too close to it, that, you know, all the the mistakes and little minor things that other people once it's finished, aren't really going to see, and they're not going to notice and they'll think it looks great, but you remember all of the, the things that should have been. So, but. so on a related note, now you're in the middle of building a project that isn't quite repair. It's more of a copy of something that's, been around is that in your family that step stool uh yeah um I'm trying to think of where we got that from i think my mother-in-law had has a little like shaker step stool like that um and i think she got it from a local woodworker where she's from and uh the kids liked it so uh they she gifted us with one to have for them and then someone else liked it. So they wanted me to build one. So yes, I'm in mid production of this said step stool. And since it's from, so for somebody else, like if it for me, I would go to the trouble of doing some sort of fancy joinery or whatnot, but it's getting pocket screwed, <laughs> so. <laughs> which is fine. It's it. I mean, it totally works for that little right. project and, and it, you know, it's plenty strong and, It'll be just fine. So, yeah, but so, but looking at that, I'm thinking, you know, that's a pretty fun project. So, uh, thinking of ways to wood smithify it and maybe get it into the magazine for other people to build and. Oh, that'd be cool. So, yeah, I'd like to see but, that. Cause mm -hmm. I think that's fair on a project too, is that there might be a piece that, especially as woodworkers where it just looks really cool or there's a family story behind it, but sometimes you just got to know when to pull the plug and maybe you mm -hmm. just build a replica of it. Right. And let the, let the jungle take the other one. Right. <laughs> yes. It's always easier to build it the second time. I feel like, <laughs> like I've done this once before and then I made a mistake and you know, the second time around it's even easier. Yep. So, yeah, so I, yeah, I think, uh, Rob, who we were talking about earlier had some of that where it was like, Oh, I cut this dovetail the wrong way and I'm going to redo it. And it's a learning, you know, chalk it up to a learning experience and you'll know for next time. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
So next week, we hope to hear back from Logan on his trip out to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. He took a class with Jimmy Clues again on turning. Mostly artsy kind of turning, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah you, you, he um, has gone out there a couple times now and he turns lots of things. And it's like, how many possible things can you turn, like a bowl or a vase or whatnot? But he, is, there's always some sort of different form right. you know, he's coming up with and that you would never think of or a different finish or yeah. whatever. So it's always cool to see what he brings back and what he's up to. Especially since I'm not much of a turner and don't really want to get into it, but it's really fun to see other people who are nerding out in a related hobby and, mm -hmm. you know, appreciating what they're learning or involved with and seeing how their skills develop. Cause I mean, Logan didn't pick up turning till just a, you know, a couple of years ago. Right. And then mm -hmm. he just kind of went hat, went at it and, Mm -hmm. Now he's doing like shields and turning burls and pieces of wood that look like they're about to blow up when he's got them on the lathe. And, <laughs> and some do. And some do. Some do blow up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's lots of cool things you can do. Yeah. Once again, thank Shaper Tools. They're sponsoring today's episode. They make the Shaper Origin, that handheld CNC router. I'm sure you've seen it in a variety of places. It adds digital precision to your woodworking. You can do all kinds of stuff with it that gives you both speed and precision, you know, like cabinetry construction, hardware installation, joinery, quite a bit of stuff. You can try it in your shop risk-free for 30 days. Check out shapertools.com to learn more. So what are you working on for projects? Um, Design-wise, you got see. anything? I, what was this? Oh, um... Steve just finished building the green and green picture frames that uh, I talked about recently. So those are done. We just need to get some glass and mats and stuff cut for them. And those will be in the next issue of the magazine. I think we're going to – we have some poster patent prints of some hand tools that we – that I think Logan got for us. Mm -hmm. And we've been selling through the uh, store or web store. And I think we're going to – frame those so i think that'll be pretty cool a uh, little project and then um steve is working on or i think kind of just finishing up uh was started out as a mason bee house mm -hmm. project and it's turned into a full-fledged uh insect condo so we can house bees and butterflies and lace wings and ladybugs or whatever yeah whatever your garden needs sure. you know Benef beneficial insects yeah. for your garden. So kind of come into it, started, you know, small and has gone into a full housing project. So, yeah, now, I thought it was kind of cool because a lot of the ones in the research that we were doing, or you were doing mostly on, mm -hmm. it was just, you know, for Mason bees, it's, they don't have giant nests or hives or whatever. They just, um, use tubes and create mm -hmm. little pockets where they have their offspring in there. And so a lot of them you see are just like a little bundle of tubes and that's it. And you ended up with mm -hmm. something that has a little bit more style to it and more fun to build. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of ways I saw that uh, people are doing the tubes for the Mason bees. You can buy like natural hollow reed tubes or, or cardboard or plastic tubes that, that they can, uh, nest in, or you can, you know, just drill, you know, deep holes. I think they like four to six inches, uh, deep and like five sixteenths inch diameter. So you can just drill holes in logs or, mm -hmm. you know, long sticks or dowels. They like that. And, um, I think another thing I have in that house is just creating, uh, holes with a like core box bit. So it'd be matching, Two matching halves that you glue up and you end up with a bunch of holes. So I oh. kind of included all that. Cool. And then um, different other insects like other, you know, different housing and nesting uh, boxes. So kind of included all that stuff in there and we'll get it all finished and painted and put it out and 
see what we can get yeah. in our garden. That'll so, be cool. That'll be fun yeah. to see. So, so we got that going on, and those are about done. And I'm trying to think what we have coming up here. I think the future projects I have are, I think, a plant stand or plant shelf. So oh, that's yeah. pretty abstract yet. Of <laughs> see what we'll come up with. So Becky is our plant keeper, so I was kind of getting ideas from her. So we'll see what what happens there. And then uh, I think I have a shop project as well, uh, maybe uh, like power tool storage or something. So okay, those are always fun. You know? Now, as a designer especially for the magazine, do you appreciate having like a specific thing to go with or do you kind of in, would you rather, there you go. Would you rather question or would you <laughs> rather just get a vague idea and then just start exploring? Yeah. Um, I'd say the easiest thing is like somebody just points at something and it's like, I want that. And then it's like, <laughs> Oh, that, well that's, that's really easy. And then, you know, to come up with that because it's very specific. But I know it's kind of fun to see um, kind of the progression of an idea or like a general topic. And you start doing research and you kind of get an idea. And then it's like, oh, well, wouldn't this be cool? And, you know, see how it grows. And then get other people's opinions sure. and see what they like or how they would use a certain um, piece of furniture or um, shop uh, project and just kind of see where it goes. And then, um, you get to the deadline and that's what you're going with. And, <laughs> and then like, even it's funny cause it's like, it's hard because you have to, I'm a lot of the, the projects I'm not building, I'm handing it off to someone else. So I have to have, you know, very specific dimensioned drawings for them to build it. And we get to that point and, um, even, no, like having the project designed and dimensioned out and seeing and the wood picked out and the finish picked out and you hand it off to someone else and, you know, to see what uh, Steve does with it and how he builds it. It's just always amazing. Like, oh, I, you know, it's even better than I pictured. Yeah. So it's all, you know, it's, it's, it's stressful, but it's always cool to see the final um, project when there's multiple people involved. Sure. So. I just wasn't sure, you know, because in the past we've, I don't know, for lack of a better word, we've called them the pottery barn projects where mm -hmm. somebody sees something inevitably in a, a catalog like pottery barn or something mm -hmm. and then hands it off to you guys in the design group to make a version of. Mm -hmm. And then like, is that insulting? Because essentially we just want, somebody wants you to just draw something that already exists. Right. Or do you see it as like, okay, I'm going to take that, but it's going to be more like inspired by this piece. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's definitely the thing. You don't want to copy the exact piece that someone else did. So you're always trying to, you know, see how you can change it and without, you know, totally going off the rails. Yeah. But so yeah, there's challenges in both approaches, I guess, but you know, you, you if uh the ones that I think I appreciate the most is like a lot of times we're just given a general like we come up with all these ideas and it's like oh these are all the projects we're going to build this year and then you get to that issue and you just pick one off the list and um you don't really have you're not like necessarily super passionate about it or when you get started, but like the projects that I need in my house or, you know, something that I'm interested in are the ones that I'm usually more passionate about and come up with better ideas because it's something that I want or something that I need to, you know, have the need for. Yeah. So those are always the most fun to come f to uh, fru fruition and maybe get to take it home and whatnot or build another version for yourself. Yeah. But. Work out the bugs first. Yeah. So have you ever had a project where you wanted it back? Like I kind of wish, you know, like, cause at some point, like you could just keep designing and working through iterations mm -hmm. or whatever until, you know, the end of time, so to speak. But mm -hmm. like you said, there are deadlines and at some point you got to hand drawings off to the shop. Right. 
Um, I'm sure there's ones that they've wanted to send back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's always hard. Be- I think that's the hardest thing about designing is because there's always it, – it, it's never perfect it, when you have to send it off and it's just like, oh, I wish I could have done this or I never really – fully solved this problem that I had with it. And so, I mean, in a sense, there's always, you know, something, sure. you know, and, and you can't just keep dwelling on that project and building iterations of it. You got to move on. And so I don't know. Yeah. I guess in a sense, they're never, you know, fully formed or perfect and, but you know, they're done. Right. So, yeah. And, and they're good. And, and it's just, you know, minor stuff and it's, it's like the the little mistakes that you know about that no one else um, really has a problem with. Yeah. And, and so. I also think it's kind of interesting because we end up seeing the whole process of it, you know, like all this backstory that readers don't know or sl- – necessarily care about, you know, mm-hmm. all the, the design meetings or the, you know, discussion that went into why we chose a particular path. And it's just, it's interesting, you know, like we see it and know what we think could have been different or, and, and not necessarily even better, just different that mm-hmm. once it's done, it's like, oh yeah, this is a, this. And it would, it's just the way it should be. That's how it was supposed to turn yep. out. Yeah. And it's even cool. Like the story continues past, you know, the projects that we create for the magazine. We get pictures back and emails back that, you know, people have built the project or they change something dimensionally or finish or, or wood type. And it's like, oh, I never even thought of that. And that, you know, totally changes it. And that's cool. Yeah. And it, it kind of goes on from there. Mm-hmm. So. I think even when we do it for, like, if we do it for a video edition project or YouTube or the TV show, it always seems like there's a certain amount of interpretation that ends up happening as well, whether we end Mm -hmm. up changing a joinery style on it or materials, like you said, or something that ends up making it look sometimes subtly different, but sometimes changes the process enough that the build is, is different too. Right. And like the chair we're working on, all that stuff will be edited out and no one will ever know (laughs) that we had problems with that chair. And they'll just like be, wow, you guys just are amazing. And how do you never make mistakes? It turns out every time. And you'll be just, we'll just shake our head and be like, you'll never never know. know. You'll never know. You'll never know our struggles. Yeah. You know? Yeah. (laughs) It's the tears of a clown when no one's around. Right. But it's yep. a journey. So, speaking of struggles, I just got a, a, a text that reminded me to apologize to um, our YouTube uh, um, viewers or listeners or whatnot. Uh, I got a call at my personal residence on Sunday asking um, if we were, if we did not do a podcast this past week <laughs> and why is it not up? And, and as, and I did have it all ready to go. I thought I had it scheduled to go out Friday morning and apparently I didn't. So I apologize to them and my mom who was that right. caller wondering where the podcast was. So if you were looking for it last week, that's where it was. Cause my mom just texted and about the po- podcast that made me think of that. So she said, do you and Phil, um, what'd she say? She said, do you and Phil respond to your commenters? Because one of our commenters was asking for a tour, apparently, oh. of, I think they said they were going to come through um, Iowa this All summer. Right. So we need to get in touch yeah. with them. But I don't remember who it was, so we'll have to, but yes, come in, stop by the summer, give us a call or your email, let us know when you're coming. Yeah, for sure. You can call the customer service number with the magazine. Uh, I think that number is also on our website, woodsmith.com or uh, yeah, leave a comment in the YouTube channel or an email woodsmith Mm -hmm. at woodsmith.com and we'll be able to hook you up with a tour. It'll be kind of fun because we have our 
it's not really a new place, but a lot of it feels new around here in how we've changed up our offices and facilities, especially coming out of the COVID years and what we have. So but it's still pretty fun because we have our video studio people can see and our photo studio and the production shop and get to meet the people that are around here. It's, it's a fun tour. I mm -hmm. like working here and I like showing it yeah. off. And, and by the summer we'll have our moving done hopefully and our mess cleaned up and we'll be all organized right. and yeah, but we always, yeah, say, we that. always say that. Yeah. Cause right now this room and the photo studio have a very room of requirement feel to them stuff piled up all over the place yep yeah and i'm in a conference room in a building that we will not have the, by this summer anymore yeah. so we'll have all of our stuff in one building <laughs> finally and that will be so nice in very many ways it'll be really cool mm -hmm. so Uh, yeah, we should uh, just give out my cell phone number, and then we can have get live calls and texts right. during. There we go. The podcast. We'll just send out something on so. the. Let me check our recent podcast. See if there's any other questions or comments. So this was last week's. Let's see. Oh, we were talking about tool cases and such. Oh. Oh yeah. yeah. All right. So here we go. Fearsome Warrior writes, I like most of the tool cases for occasional use in travel. A, reciproca a reciprocating saw is a good example. A drill driver I use often do not need a case. It's the grouping and case sizes that give me the most trouble. Get a tool, but then you need blades or something for it and got to find a place for that. This is where you guys come in. Drill press cabinet houses all those weird accessories like a fly cutter and the mini little bit sets. True story. Mm -hmm. Rick writes, I do keep all my tool manuals and plastic cases, but the cases over the years have been pushed further and further back underneath some bench or on top of some cabinet. All empty. Can't bring myself to get rid of them. I may need them someday. I, oh, and here he is. Rick, we'll need to be in Iowa in July and would love to stop by your shop and studio. Who should I contact for a tour? Well, there you go, Rick. We'll reply to you on there, but like I said, just uh, contact customer service and we can put together that or send us an email would be the best way to do it so that we know when to expect you weekdays are better because we're not usually here on the weekends. Um, but there you go. And then Robert writes, I blame those doors you pick up at home Depot. Once I walk through one, I cannot remember why I walked into that room. Mm -hmm. yep. It's a struggle. It is a struggle. Yeah. Yeah, so the other thing is, speaking of the tool cases, I'm two weeks in to my getting rid of one more thing right. each day. So what are you so, up to? So that's, what, 15 items or? Yep, yep. So still going strong. I felt like I had a, a good base to start with, so <laughs> have not waned. But it, I feel like it's a lot of just right now going through – little boxes and containers of random hardware. And it's like, I don't need these three random yeah. screws. I can get rid of them or maybe I do need them and they just get put where they're supposed to go and just get put yeah. away. So, so does that count putting them away? But, uh, does not count towards okay. the getting rid of, but it is kind of, you know, a success. That's one of the bonuses is that, you know, Stuff gets put away yeah. as well. It's like, I'm not throwing this away, but it's going to get put away in a place, you know? Okay. So, but I still have a lot of big things in the garage that I need to do something with that I've been pushing down the road. So I might get to the end of the month and it's like, I got some big things here and don't know what to do with them. So, but still going strong halfway yeah. through. So do you feel so, like, are you sandbagging some stuff or it's like, I, I'm, I know that once I get into the twenties, I need some things. So you're like, I'm just going to get that over. Yeah. I'm saving <laughs> these for the, for the saving these, all these little random pieces yeah. as filler for high numbered days. So is it embarrassing to think so. like you're, you haven't really got 
into the meat yet? Like you're still trimming fat? Um, no, no, I don't think so. Cause I know it's, I know sure. it's going to get harder. Um, so yeah, I feel good right now. I, I feel like, you know, I could go past the 30 days, but we'll see how the next two weeks go. Cause we're in, you know, double digits and growing yeah. every day. So it's going to start getting exponential yeah. here. So, all right. But, but yeah, that would be cool to see if some of our listeners would be willing to try that. Maybe some right. I wish I would have yeah taken pictures of each thing. Oh yeah, and, and kind of have of um, documented this a little bit better. But yeah, maybe next <laughs> month. <laughs> yeah, so I'm still going so strong. if you kept going, would you continue on like thirty two, thirty three, or would you just start over back at one right. and then work your way up? Or maybe I don't know. I have, I'm gonna have to see where. Down. Ooh, there you go. That might be easier. I'm gonna have to see where I am at the end of the month if I can keep growing or if it's like take a break and reboot or or what yeah. it is. So all right, but I don't. Know. This is the first time I've done this. So all right, I'll thirty you know. day challenge, everybody. Let me know if you'd be interested in doing it. Put it up there. I should probably mm -hmm. do that in my shop and house. Hand office. Yeah. Like you could probably just even and do it. I know everyone's got a coffee can of hardware. Just go through that. Go like start with one thing out of that <laughs> coffee can and then two things and then three, you know, either organize it yeah. or get rid of it. Well, I know my dad time. Uh, just moved within the last month. And well, and you just moved last year too. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's the part of the moving process where it's like, we're going to look through everything and, you know, make sure that we really need to use all this stuff before moving it over. You know, we're just not going to move a bunch of junk over to the house. So you got this real mm -hmm. idealistic mindset into your head. And then at some point, every move feels like turns into an evacuation where right. it's just like, I don't care. Just pile it in boxes or throw it in the car and we're taking it over mm -hmm. to the new place. And yeah. Yeah, I felt like I did pretty good because, I mean, I had several months leading up to to, to kind of plan to get rid of stuff. But then like going through this, it's like, why do I have this piece of hardware that was to the swing set at the old house? <laughs> How did this get moved? Or, you know, just yeah. stuff like that. It's like, how, how did this make the cut? Yeah. What happened to me? You know? Yeah, because I know my dad, he would probably so. freely admit that he was a keeper of random items in his shop. And when he got to the prospect of where they were like, okay, it's real. We are going to move like moving that much stuff out of his shop sort of horrified him. But he found that mm -hmm. I think like you did with this 30 day challenge is you can get started. And then all of a sudden it's a lot easier to let go of things rather mm -hmm. than. Yeah, it is freeing. Yes. So then all of a sudden it started cascading and he was, he was getting rid of stuff hand over fist then. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've found like, you know, I have a good set of screwdrivers that all match that, you know, should be hanging and on my pegboard, not mm -hmm. always there, but should be. And then I find all these just random screwdrivers that are different lengths and colors Conditions. and all this stuff. It's like, why do I have all these screwdrivers or why do I have all these random Allen wrenches, and you know, just yeah. let them go. I'll, every time I get a new like toy or kids piece of furniture to assemble, I'll get more Allen wrenches than or little tiny yeah. wrenches that they always package with that stuff, and it'll add up. Yeah, the yeah the other thing too, I guess, is going through all this. You kind of get to take inventory because. Seems like every time I need a stud finder, it's like I can't find my stud finder. So then I go buy another one. I I think I found at least two or three <laughs> stud finders as I'm doing this. So then you can hopefully right. put them away where you'll know where they'd be. So I don't another, go yeah. buy another one the next time I need it. So hopefully that works well too is, is inventorying and putting stuff away and it'll save me the cost of and the hassle of buying it again, even yeah. though I already have it. Yeah. So, 
that. Life lessons here on the Shop Notes podcast. Always something to take away. Sure. I think that wraps up another episode for the Shop Notes podcast. Thanks for listening. want to say again, thanks to Shaper Tools for sponsoring this month's podcast. They have the Shaper Origin. You've probably seen videos of it uh, online if you've cruised the social medias recently. Uh, it's a handheld CNC router, and it adds digital precision to your woodworking. You can do all kinds of things from hardware installation, cabinetry projects, joinery, all that kind of stuff. Adding speed and precision, like I said, you can get one in your shop risk-free for 30 days. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, check out their website, shapertools.com. Uh, also want to do the standard call out to please rate and review the podcast wherever you subscribe to podcasts because it helps us to get the Shop Notes podcast out to more woodworkers and people who are just interested in talking shop. Otherwise, we'll see you next week, everybody, on the Shop Notes podcast. Bye. Bye.